And what he did was uh, 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 gave me two mutants uh, that were nice and requiring, and a block in the pathway from tryptophan to niacin. It was known that tryptophan was a precursor <coughs> of niacin in Narospora. And he gave me two mutants, and he told me, go isolate the accumulated intermediate and identify other intermediates in the tryptophan niacin pathway. So we isolated and identified quinolinic acid, which is an intermediate, and also I isolated alpha and acetylchimurin, which is a modified form of chimurin, which is another intermediate. But at the time, everyone in the Bayer group was trying to figure out what would be an ideal system to provide additional understanding of the gene enzyme relationship. They were all looking for some ideal gene an enzyme in, in the ROSPA with which to work with to provide further understanding. And uh, they convinced me as well. And in my last year as a graduate student, I started working with the only enzyme that was known in the tryptophan pathway. None of the enzymes were known in the niacin pathway. So I published two papers. Uh, I examined two mutants, existing mutants that were defective in the tryptophan desmolase of Marospora, and I also uh, put some effort into trying to purify this protein. Uh, purifying the protein from Marospora turned out to be very difficult. There was no known way of altering the regulation and increasing the production, and the plasmids didn't even exist yet that were known. So uh, I decided that, read the literature, and there were a few examples where uh, using bacteria, one was able to grow a mutant on a limiting concentration of an intermediate and produce high levels of enzyme. So I began to look at tryptophan niacin relationship in, uh, in E. coli and bacillus subtilis. And these were isotope experiments where it essentially provided radioactive tryptophan and examined whether the niacin that was produced would be radioactive. And the shocking discovery was that that was not labeled and that uh, these two bacteria use different pathway than the pathway that's in the Rospera. So uh, although I attempted to find a suitable enzyme and pathway, uh, this, this, this experiment failed. Uh, in the course of our studies, I did mutational studies, and if you isolated mutants at Neurospora that were blocked in the indole tryptophan reaction, they all were mutated in the same gene, tryptophan desmolase gene, which was then named tryptophan synthase and then tryptophan synthase. And, uh, but if you take the mutant and you isolate revertins, the surprising finding is that there are Mutants are all over the place. They're not in the tryptophan desmolase gene. And so non-allelic suppressor genes affecting a single TD allele. So this was my involvement in a really basic question. How do you suppress a mutant? Uh, what sort of genes are involved? Also, it was obvious to me that in order to uh, purify and an inactive enzyme, you had to have some way of identifying. You could use an enzyme assay. So uh, with another student, with a student of Dave Bonner, Sig Suskin, uh, we, we developed antibodies against wild type uh, tryptophan synthase of Neurospora, and we showed that those antibodies wouldn't react to the mutant protein, and so that we could then purify, identify the mutant protein. So uh, this was the first use of the antibodies to identify what we called a CRIM, cross-reacting material. And that was also an important contribution. Now, uh, in 1954, I was offered a position as assistant professor in the microbiology department at Western Reserve Medical School, and I accepted that position. Uh, on thinking about what I should work on as a new assistant professor, I decided the gene enzyme relationship was too risky and I should pick something more conservative. And so I decided, well, why not 
figure out the rest of the intermediates in the niacin in a, in a tryptophan pathway. It was known at the time that anthanoic and indole were uh, precursors of tryptophan, and that's because mutants were known that accumulated indole and anthanoic acid, but nothing was known about these intermediate reactions, and nothing was known about why that these intermediates couldn't be identified. One enzyme had been identified, the enzyme tryptophan desmolase would catalyze the last reaction in tryptophan formation. So I decided to work, start out by working out the bi biochemical pathway using enzymology. And a series of publications, and when I, after I went to Western Reserve, I identified three phosphorylated intermediates that serve between anthanoic and indole. And the, the reason they're not accumulated in an active form by mutants is because they're phosphorylated. Phosphorylated compounds are dephosphorylated, they're secreted out of the cell, and the, the dephosphorylated form can't support the growth of mutants. So that's why these were not identified by the classical methods. Uh, the one last step was identified by a good friend, Frank Gibson, in Australia. This is the precursor, prismic acid, and uh, Frank showed that prismic acid was the precursor of the other two aromatic amino acids, phenol and tyrosine, as well as PNPA. But th this finding essentially said that tryptophan biosynthesis has to compete with the synthesis of two more common amino acids, phenol and tyrosine, that was a hint that regulation is going to be damn important. So uh, our studies with E. coli also identified that there were seven genetic regions involved in this pathway of tryptophan synthesis, and these are shown here, trip A through trip G. In uh, 1958, I was offered a position at Stanford in the biology department, and uh, essentially, they were, they were looking for somebody to replace Beetle and Tatum, who was working in the They didn't know that most of my research interest was in bacteria. I didn't tell them about that. <laughs> <laughs> they also invited me to interview for a position in, in <coughs> December. And uh, in Cleveland, in December, I hadn't seen the sun for three months. <laughs> and, uh, and when I came out of here, it was a day like this. So, so I made a list of uh, important considerations, but clearly weather, weather <laughs> went out. <laughs> so I came to Stanford, and I occupied Tatum's space, old space in the, at a basement of Jordan Hall. And my first postdoc at Stanford was Irvin Crawford. And uh, I decided that tryptophan desmolase, that then called synthetase, would be that's an enzyme, and so we could work on that. And so he, he uh, characterized tryptophan synthase, synthase of E. coli and showed that it consists <coughs> of two protein components. But this was a major contribution, and we had picked this enzyme as an enzyme with which to study the gene-enzyme relationship. It was also obvious to me that we would have to use a very sophisticated genetic analysis to construct a fine structured genetic map. One couldn't isolate genes or sequence genes at the time. The best one could do to characterize genetic material is to perform a fine structured genetic map. And so I read the work at Lennox and I collaborated with him in showing that phage P1KC could be used in transduction experiments to construct fine structured genetic maps. And that turned out to be disgusting. This was one of my favorite photos, and it was taken in Tatum's old lab in the basement of Jordan Hall in 1959, when I received, the I received the Eli Lilly Award in Bacteriology for my studies of tryptophan biosynthesis in E. coli. And uh, I like this photo because these, these pipette cans and, uh, and uh, uh, plate stars, the same ones. I still have my lab now. <laughs> but what's most impressive about this photograph, which I can't remember, 
is that the, in those days we wore ties to lab every day. <laughs> <laughs> now we wore a tie when we did the song. <laughs>